Good evening, everybody. How you doing? Doing, well, doing all right. Does everybody have a bulletin? All right. Does everybody have a hymnal in front of them? That's the next question. All right. Get that baby ready. We are going to be using it throughout the service. Well, this is a, a special service for us as we celebrate Maundy Thursday. It's always good for me as we enter into Holy Week to try to remember you know, what's the significance? Why is Holy Week special to us? What exactly are we remembering and celebrating? During Maundy Thursday, we remember how Jesus and the disciples traveled together to Jerusalem, and they were traveling to Jerusalem to celebrate the Jewish uh, Passover. This was a huge celebration. It wasn't like a, a little party, but Jerusalem would have been crowded with people who had come to celebrate and this celebration lasted days and days and days. I think it was about a week long. Now, one of the evenings during the Passover celebration, we read in the scripture that Jesus and his disciples were in a room together, and they were sharing a, a meal. This wasn't out of the ordinary. They had shared many, many, many meals together throughout the, the three years they spent together. But this meal in particular is really important. It's really special because the timing in which it fell. As they ate that meal, um, right after the meal, they would be heading out to the Mount of Olives into a little garden called the Garden of Gethsemane. We know that in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus' passion, his sacrifice really began. It's amazing to think that as Jesus and the disciples have this meal together, that the very next day, Jesus would be crucified. So we know as they gather together for this meal that um, this is some of the last moments they will share together before things really go sideways, before things go very unexpectedly. You know, at this point, Jesus knows that his time is coming to an end on this earth. And can't you just imagine how, as he shares that meal with the disciples, this last meal, how he must have been flooded with so many different emotions. And in my mind, I can just imagine how Jesus picked his words so carefully, and he picked his actions carefully as well. He wanted his last words and his last moments in relationship with his disciples in this way to have meaning and importance. During this meal, Jesus says and does some unexpected things. First of all, we know that during this meal, Jesus gets uh, out a towel and he wraps it around his waist and he begins to wash his disciples' feet. While they had shared meals together before, nowhere in Scripture does it say that Jesus had ever washed their feet before. Can you imagine the disciples' surprise as Jesus got down on his hands and knees and began to scrub away the filth from their feet? After he was done washing their feet, uh, Jesus also says some unexpected things. He takes the bread and the wine, just these common, ordinary food items for him and the disciples, but he gives them new meaning and significance. And he, he tells them how this bread, it represents his broken body, which is being broken for them and for others. And he takes the wine and he said, hey, this wine is symbolic of my blood that I'm going to shed for you and for many so that you may be forgiven. During that meal, Jesus tells them that when they gather together to eat the bread and drink the wine, that they are to remember him and remember that meal that they had together. This is where we get Holy Communion. With this picture in our minds, as we think about Jesus and the disciples having this intimate moment, this last moment of fellowship before things go really, really crazy, let's stand together and we're going to sing our first hymn. It is the gift of love. We're going to sing verses 1 through 3. You can find it in your pew hymnal, 
Uh, it's number 408. Please join me in the response of prayer. You'll be reading, we'll be reading together the bold. Brothers and sisters, this is a night to remember. We remember the meal Jesus shared with his disciples. We remember the water, the towel, the washed feet. We remember the broken bread and the cup of wine. We remember the new covenant of love. We remember the betrayal of a beloved friend. Tonight we remember and give thanks. Let's remain standing and sing hymn number 402, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. We're going to sing verses 1 through 4.
Amen. You all may be seated. Hear this word from the Gospel of John. I'm going to be reading John chapter 13, verses 12 through 17. And then I'm going to be jumping forward, uh, forward to verses 31 through 35. Listen to what it says. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus continued on. Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. As we think through that scripture, I have a question for you. If anybody knows this, I'll be amazed. I wish I had a prize because you'll deserve it. But who knows what a plumb bob is? Have you ever heard of that? A plumb bob? <laughs> yeah, that's right. You all are smart. I'm glad I didn't offer a prize because like five of you would have needed it. So a plumb bob, this is not a plumb bob. This is a, a watch. But a plumb bob is a heavy object that is on a string, not so different than this watch. And usually the item that is the heavy item on the string is shaped like a cylinder, almost like a, a top that you would spin. It kind of tapers to a point at the very bottom. Now, plumb bobs have been around for, for a really, really long time. In fact, evidence of plumb bobs trace all the way back to the ancient Egyptians, and uh, archaeologists believe that the Egyptians used plumb bobs to build the pyramids, that that was a tool that they used to, to create the pyramids and other structures. Not only did the ancient Egyptians use plumb bobs, but they were also used by the Romans, and the Europeans used them extensively during the Renaissance period. The Renaissance period was a period of um, art, but it was also a period of great building, and plumb bob was smack dab in the center of it. As you all have said, the plumb bob was used by the builder of the structure, the architect, if you will, and they would use that tool to make sure that the walls they were building were perfectly plumb, perfectly vertical. That heavy item on a string, um, gravity really is the at the heart of the plumb bob, gravity pulls a heavy object completely, uh, perfectly straight down. And what they would do is as they erected a wall, they would use that item on that string to see if it swung away or was too close to it. It needed to remain the same distance the whole way. If it was off just a little bit, that plumb bob would show them and they would know they had better start over because that wall was off, even maybe just a degree or two. Uh, you know, think about that. Even from the beginning of time, people who built structures, they knew that these things had to be perfectly plumb or else. Think of all that can go wrong if you build a structure and those walls are off even just a hair. If the walls are off even just a smallest little amount, that entire structure is going to be compromised. It's not going to hold weight as it's supposed to. Everything's going to uh, be at risk for co collapsing and not functioning properly. Alicia and I are doing some house hunting, and we were in a house 
that didn't have plumb walls. They must not have used their plumb bob, whoever built this thing. I'm sure it was plumb at one point, but maybe from settling or whatever, the walls didn't wear plumb. And check this out. You couldn't shut a single door in that house. Every door frame was just off kilter, just enough to make you want to, if you had hair, pull your hair out, like just to drive you crazy. Every floor in there was, was, was bubbling, and every uh, drywalled ceiling had little stress cracks because that structure wasn't holding the weight as it was designed to. It, was, it wasn't plumb. Believe it or not, the Bible talks about plumb bobs. Did you know that? It doesn't use that word plumb bob, but it talks about plumb lines, which is the same sort of idea. Listen to Isaiah 28, 17. The prophet Isaiah writes this. The sovereign Lord says, I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line. Listen to the prophet Amos in Amos 7, verses 7 through 9. Amos is talking about a vision that he received from God. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that had been built true to plumb with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, look, I am setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. When the Bible talks about a plumb bob or a plumb line, it's always used symbolically. And the Bible refers to that plumb line as this divine standard that God's going to use to judge his people. The Bible envisions God as the, the builder of the structure, the church, that his people dwell and how God tests and judges that structure by using that plumb line. You know what we see unfold in the Old Testament, unfortunately, is this. While God had made Israel true to plumb, while he had made them straight and true, that Israel had been compromised, they had gotten out of whack. And now, because they were so off kilter, they would be destroyed. They were going to collapse in upon themselves. I love how in the Isaiah passage, it said that justice was going to be the measuring line and righteousness would be the plumb line, the standard by which the Lord would measure and judge his people. As we read that those scriptures from the prophets and as we consider this ancient tool, the plumb line, the plumb bob, somewhere in us we've got to begin to ask a question, and this is the million-dollar question. This is the all-important question. If, if God... Uh, if the people envision God symbolically using this plumb line, this uh, measure of justice, this straight line by which to judge his people, we, as Jesus followers today, have got to ask, well, what is the measure by which we are going to be judged? What's the plumb line that God's going to use um, to judge us? What is the standard God has called, a, called us to? And then we have to ask the even harder question, are we hitting the mark? What is the mark? Are we close or are we far away? You know, in that scripture we read from the Gospel of John, Jesus tells his disciples and he tells us what the plumb line is. He, he explains to his disciples and to us as his disciples today what the measurement is going to be that we are going to be held accountable to, how we are going to be judge. First, he, he shows them by his actions. He gets down on his hands and knees, and he humbles himself, and he begins to uh, wash and dry his disciples' feet. And then he tells him, tells the disciples and us with his words, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Immediately that began with, as I have loved you. He's just done the unthinkable. He's humbled himself and scrubbed their nasty, dirty feet. And then he says, as I have loved you, so love one another. He gives us a hint at what type of love this is supposed to be. He's like, it's the type of love that gets you on your hands and knees to wash somebody else's filth away. 
When Jesus says to love one another, can't you see that this is like a, a humble love, a love undergirded by humility? And this is also a sacrificial love. It's the type of love that costs the giver something. It carries with it a, a burden of sorts. I'm paraphrasing here. This isn't some weird translation. This is the Ryan translation. Jesus at that meal shows his disciples what the plumb line was, what the measuring stick is, and then he essentially says with his words, you're going to be measured by your humble, sacrificial love for one another. This humble, sacrificial love is the standard to which you are called as my followers. This humble, sacrificial love is the mark which you must hit. Ultimately, it's the measuring stick by which you will be held accountable. Just in case you think I'm making too much out of this earlier, Jesus had said, the two greatest commandments are this. Love God with everything you have and love your neighbor as yourself. So this was a theme that Jesus had been um, harking on for quite some time. So here's the hard part. We know what the plumb line is. We know what the measuring stick is that we are going to be held accountable for, that um, we're going to have to answer to someday. Humble, sacrificial love of others. So the question becomes, how are we doing? You know, just like that house, if w even just one wall isn't perfectly plumb, the whole structure goes with it. I think that's what happens in the life of the church, too. When we as the body of believers miss this mark, even by a fraction, we risk putting the whole body in jeopardy. When we as the body of believers miss this mark, we risk like the, getting so skewed that we are completely out of sorts and that we are not fulfilling the calling that God is giving us. So I ask you, and I ask myself this as well, how are you doing at loving God? How are you doing with that? Are you in a season in which you can boldly and confidently say, I am loving God well? Or are you in one of those times in the life of faith where you're going, man, I don't know that I'm doing too good at that. The second question, how are you loving others? How are you getting on your, down on your knees, if you will, to scrub somebody else's filth away? How are you showing them that just kind of sacrificial, humble love? As you think on those questions, maybe what's an invitation that God is putting before you in this moment? How might he be calling you to uh, ramp up this love of God and love of others? As you think through that, we are going to uh, prepare to take communion. And you know, I was thinking about communion a bit more, uh, preparing for this service. And when we take communion, we are reminded of this plumb line. We are reminded of this target that we are aiming for, that really at the heart of communion is a, a humble love and a sacrificial love. Jesus, humble and sacrificial love for us, but also our humble and sacrificial love for one another. You know, I'm reminded that as we say the liturgy together and as we eat the bread together and as we drink the juice together, that God is with us in a real way and that somehow God is binding us together, one another. He's fashioning us together into one body. As we take these elements I pray that you would hear the whisper of Jesus, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this measuring stick, my words, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Amen. Let's direct our attention to the, you can stay in your hymnal, go all the way to the front of the hymnal to page 12. And there we're going to find the liturgy that we're familiar with. It is, the heading for it is a service of word, word and table two. I'll give you a moment to get there. Just like we do with the projector screen on Sundays, you all will be reading the bold together and I'll be reading the normal 
typeface. Page 12 there. Y'all there? All right. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law, we have rebelled against your love, and we have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We confess that we, we're not perfectly plumb, are we? Hear this good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Go to the next page, and we're going to be starting where it says the great thanksgiving. So this is on page 13, the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right in a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. I'm skipping down a, a bit now. Go down to the part that says, and so, about halfway down page 14. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Heavenly Father, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in, in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now, with the confidence of the children of God, let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, during that meal with the disciples, Christ took the loaf of bread, and he broke the bread, and he gave thanks to God, and he told his disciples, Take and eat, each of you. This is my body, which is broken for you. After that meal was over, Christ took the cup of wine and he held it up and he gave thanks to his heavenly father. And then he told his disciples, drink from this cup, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. This time, I invite you all to come forward. We're going to receive communion through intinction, which that's a fancy word for meaning you're going to rip off a hunk of bread 
and you're going to dip it in the cup of juice, and then you can, can take it right after you get that uh, bread and the juice. You will see there's some hand sanitizer. I encourage you to use it. Once you use it, you can kind of pass it back in line so that others can use it as well. Go ahead and, and come forward. Amen. As the body of Christ, um, covered by his precious blood, entering into this new covenant with him, let's stand together. We're going to sing our final hymn, Pass It On, verses 1 through 3. You can find this uh, 572 in your pew hymnal. 572.
Let's join together in the benediction. Jesus, we must remain in your love. May we do so by keeping your commands. Most importantly, may we keep your command to love one another well. Empower us with your spirit so we may love as you do. Amen. Amen. Well, you all are free to go as you feel led. Thank you.